I think to me, the most fascinating thing is uh, other than for intermittent fasting, because a lot of the stuff we thought about, it was wrong. Uh, in fact, the opposite. But the the most interesting thing, I think, is in the field of type 2 diabetes because it's such an important disease. Um, if you look at... Yeah, so um, the body has a certain ability to store energy in the form of sugar. So essentially, um, if you think about a sugar bowl, that's what it does too, it stores sugar. Uh, but once you reach its capacity, it sort of, you know, bulges over and then it spills out. And then when it spills out, uh, then you get it on the floor and that's when it becomes a problem. It's not a problem as long as it stays in the bowl. It's, it's much the same as the body. So the body can also store sugar. And by sugar, I mean not just uh, sugar like sucrose, which is table sugar, but sugar in terms of glucose. Um, so most starches are glucose. Blood sugar is blood glucose. So bread and rice and potatoes, they're actually long chains of glucose. So the body can store glucose uh, for energy. And uh, when you eat, you'll store some of the sugar. When you don't eat, you're going to use some of the sugar. And that's why you don't sort of die in your sleep every single night. However, if you exceed the capacity of the body's ability to store that glucose, then it's going to overflow into the blood. And then when it overflows in the blood, then they say your blood sugar is high. And then that's when you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So essentially, the problem with type 2 diabetes is that your body simply has too much glucose such that it's spilling out into the blood and then that's how it's detected and that leads to many problems uh, down the line. So understanding that makes it easy to understand why diets such as cutting down the carbohydrates, which is reducing the amount of sugar you're putting into the body, or intermittent fasting, which is allowing your body to burn off some of the sugar, uh, can be very effective for reversing type 2 diabetes. Um, it basically all of the, all of the tissues in the body get affected. So unlike most other diseases, uh, diabetes affects everything. So it causes heart problems, causes strokes, causes, um, cancers, causes, uh, uh you know, blindness in terms of eye disease. It causes, uh, nerve damage. It causes kidney damage. So pretty much, uh, causes liver damage. So pretty well every single organ you can think of in the body uh, is affected by diabetes because every single cell is sort of overflowing with this glucose. Um, the, um, you also in diabetes see these weird infections that you don't get otherwise, like diabetic foot infections and weird fungal infections. And that's because the tissues of the body have so much sugar and the bacteria really love it so that they can thrive much more easily when there's all this sugar available to them. Let's talk about the period of time before diabetes strikes in full force. And that's the continuum, the part of the continuum of insulin resistance. So we can talk back to what you explained before, the fact that somebody is having these carbohydrates or sugars, the body is trying to compensate and bring the blood glucose down by creating more insulin. Talk about that period of time that can even be up to a decade where the body is compensating for this extra glucose trying to store it away and over time what happens and what breaks yeah so insulin resistance is a term that's used because the blood glucose goes high and the body doesn't like it so high so it makes more insulin to sort of allow it to go in so one of the actions of insulin is to allow glucose to go from the blood into the cell so that the cell can use it for energy. Insulin resistance is a term that they use when they say, oh, well, there's lots of, um, you know, uh, glucose in the blood and there's lots of insulin, so why is it not going into the cell? This, so they say the cell must be resistant to, um, to the effect of insulin. And you can think of it like, suppose you have a restaurant um, and you have the doors and the doors open and the people go in. So that's what's normally supposed to happen. If you see a big crowd of people on the sidewalk, it could be that the door doesn't open. And that's the situation in type one diabetes, for example, the door, there's no insulin. So then the door doesn't open and therefore all the glucose, all the people stay outside. Um, in type two diabetes, they imagine a very similar situation to this where there is lots of insulin, but <clears throat> for some reason, the insulin is not opening up this door and allowing the people to go in. 
There's a big problem with this idea, which is one that most doctors still consider uh, to be the way that it works, is that if you think about that restaurant, if the people can't get in, then inside the restaurant, it must be empty. Um, so if you translate that to the body, you have a cell, the glucose is outside in the blood, it can't get into the cell, though the cell inside should be sort of very, it should be, you know, very empty. And therefore, if the cell has no energy inside, you should, people should be very skinny. They should be very thin. They have, should have very small shrunken livers, not big fatty livers. But in fact, you see the opposite. You see people who are overweight, who have big fatty livers, uh, and so on. So the cells are not sort of starving. They're sort of overflowing. Um, the whole diagnosis of type 2 diabetes sort of hinges on seeing that extra glucose in the blood, but that's a very late stage. It's, uh, you know, sort of 10, 12 years after what's, what's going on, uh, has, has, has been, been a problem. And, and, and that's, um, you know, that's based on sort of a, a sort of old concept of what type 2 diabetes is. There's this concept that a lot of people had mistakenly thought uh, for years that it was the high blood glucose that was causing all the problems rather than the sort of overflowing cells with glucose. So if you have cells that are overflowing with glucose, as long as the blood is normal, there's a feeling that, hey, it's all fine. But it wasn't fun because you had all these other problems going on uh, in the background that weren't being taken care of. So the idea is to try and figure it out at an earlier stage, um, but also to use, uh, you know, if you're trying to get rid of the glucose for years, there was no good drugs that could do it. There are some now, but the older drugs like the insulin, the metformin, the sulfonylureas, they weren't effective at getting rid of the glucose and therefore they didn't actually change the underlying problem with type 2 diabetes. Yeah, you can, you can look at a few things. So the metabolic syndrome is this cluster of sort of five things that all go together with high insulin levels. So you have the high blood sugars, of course, that's very late, but you have also high blood pressure. You have a high triglyceride with low HDLs and um, oh, abdominal obesity. Um, of course. So, so you, you can measure, so you, you, they don't actually use body mass index, which is very common for people with weight problems. They use uh, abdominal circumference as a sort of uh, proxy because you tend to store fat for, for metabolic syndrome more, uh, in the, in the abdominal area rather than sort of all around. Um, so the whole idea is that you can look at any of those five um, manifestations of hyperinsulinemia or the metabolic syndrome, and that'll give you a clue because not all five necessarily are going to be there. So you could have, say, just high blood pressure and all the other four are negative. That could still be a manifestation of hyperinsulinemia, or you may have high triglycerides and low HDL, or you may have just the abdominal obesity. So you can pick that up earlier. Uh, you can also use fasting insulin levels and things like that, although that's not typically done as much because there's a lot of variance in the insulin levels. Just like uh, glucose levels, it goes up and down sort of every minute of the day. It's almost all due to the insulin, really. The high blood glucose is sort of a downstream problem of that. So we had in the, in the early 2000s several very... Um, big expensive trials where the uh, they, they, they took people and they basically said, we're going to drive your blood glucose to as low a level as possible by giving you mostly like things like lots of insulin. So essentially, if you think about it, you have this cell that's sort of overfilled with glucose, right? And you're giving a lot of glucose to make sure that the glucose doesn't stay outside and you're shoving it inside. And they thought that that would be very beneficial in terms of reducing heart attacks and strokes and all this <coughs> sort of thing because the glucose in the blood was normal. They, they moved all that glucose into the cell, right? So people were gaining weight like crazy, you know, they're, because all that glucose in the cell, the, the, the body can change that into fat. Um, so even while they were making the blood glucose very good, they were making the actual diabetes worse because the cell is just super ultra full, right? So the whole point is that, uh, when they took a result, uh, they took a look at those results. 
lowering the blood glucose to near normal levels didn't actually make anybody better. In fact, it, it might have been actually quite harmful. Um, one of the studies showed an increased uh, death rate, so uh, it wasn't good at all. So most of the effect of the uh, type 2 diabetes really is the insulin, which is reflective of the sort of glucose in the whole body, not just in the blood, right? The blood is only one component of the body. There's also the, you know, the rest of the organs and inside the cells and so on. And there's just glucose sort of everywhere in there. And just taking it out of the blood and shoving it into the liver doesn't really help. You're simply moving around the problem of the excess. Sort of like if you have garbage and instead of throwing it out, you just put it under the sink and keep putting it under the sink. Well, you can't see it anymore. So you think you're doing great, but it still smells. So it's just like that glucose, right? You keep taking that glucose and instead of getting rid of it, you just shove it into the liver, shove it into the liver. Well, eventually it causes more problems because you actually haven't done anything about the excess. The excess is still around. The minute you stop taking that insulin, all that sugar just comes, you know, rushing back out because, you know, you haven't gotten rid of it. I think to me, the most fascinating thing is, uh, other than for intermittent fasting, because a lot of the stuff we thought about, it was wrong. Uh, in fact, the opposite. But the the most interesting thing, I think, is in the field of type 2 diabetes, because it's such an important disease. Um, if you look at the number of people being affected with type 2 diabetes, it's skyrocketing. So we had, since the 1970s, an increase in obesity. Then we had an increase in type 2 diabetes. And I think the most fascinating thing, the most promising thing I've heard in a long time is that you can actually start to reverse this disease by changing the diet. And I think what's interesting is that you have to understand that type 2 diabetes is largely a dietary disease. And so we treated it with drugs for a long time. And if you give drugs to a dietary disease, well, you're never going to fix it because you haven't identified the core problem and fixed it. You need to change the diet to fix that dietary problem, then the disease goes away. And now we have data on intermittent fasting, for example, and also uh, low carbohydrate diets. Dr. David Unwin published his data in the, in the UK on reversing type two diabetes with uh, reducing carbohydrates, which is showing that you can reduce about 50% of the people and put them into a completely drug-free remission state like basically cure 50% of those type two diabetics who are at risk of cancer, at risk of heart disease, at risk of strokes, at risk of blindness, at risk of kidney disease, nerve damage, infections. All these people you can fix just by changing their diet, either cutting down the carbohydrates or using intermittent fasting. And it's free and anybody can do it. I'm not talking about a drug that costs thousands of dollars. I'm not talking about a surgery which is only available to the, the, the 1%. I'm talking about a treatment, which is intermittent fasting, which is available to everybody in the entire world for free, and yet has the power to completely reverse their disease and make them so much healthier. So the question is, why don't we do it? I couldn't answer that question for you. <laughs> I try to do my part to tell people, but you know, the real reason is I think that people are slow to catch new ideas. Like when people hear about new ideas, and I'm talking about academic doctors and so on, there's an intrinsic resistance to change. So I started talking about intermittent fasting, say 2016, when the obesity code was published. I talked about it, about reversing type 2 diabetes around the same time. Um, and uh, it's just, they're just very slow to say, hey, this makes a lot of sense because for them, they've invested so much in this calories in, calories out model. They've built their entire careers on saying that it's it's your fault that you're fat, right? It's, it's the foods that you ate, it's the calories that you ate instead of trying to get to a deeper understanding. So people are very reluctant to change. In fact, I mean, it's been 10 years and you see the public, the interest in intermittent fasting has skyrocketed and yet most doctors still won't prescribe it. They won't talk about it. They know nothing about it. There's how much teaching do doctors get about intermittent fasting and why it might be helpful? Probably zero. Like why? We have this amazing tool 
And people, you know, doctors call it a fad, right? It's a fad diet. Well, it's been around for 2000 plus years. That's a long, long, long fad, right? It's, it's proven effective. If you don't eat, you're going to lose weight. What's simpler than that? If you don't eat, you're going to use up your blood glucose. Your diabetes will get better. What's wrong with that? It's not hard to understand. The diabetes code, I've got the diabetes journal here in front of me. And put simply, it talks about step one being to put less sugar in and step two being burn the sugar off. Yeah. And and step one, which relates to putting more sugar in, is all about um, low carbohydrate diets, right? Cutting down the carbohydrates. Uh, yeah, that's that's one effective way of cutting down the type 2 diabetes. In fact, the American Diabetes Association in their sort of um, nutritional journals, they talk about it uh, having the most scientific evidence of any diet. There's no diet with more evidence for reversing type 2 diabetes than cutting down the carbohydrates. If if you do it the right way, it can be a good method. If you don't do it the right way, so, so again, it, you're exactly right. There's positives and negatives. If you simply cut the fat, and eat just carbs that are very low calorie, then it may or it may work. And and this is where there's all this debate, right? People go back and forth about, oh, is it calories? Is it not? Like to me, it's it's already been decided. If it was if the solution was calorie restriction, then we would have we won't have we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic. We wouldn't have a diabetes epidemic. If we have the solution in front of us, why would the sol- why would the problem be getting worse and worse and worse over time, right? So, so to me, weight loss is more about understanding the you know it's about more about controlling the hunger, not controlling the calories, right? But it doesn't mean that if you control the hunger, like if you control the hunger, you're going to eat fewer calories. So there's an overlap there that I understand why people get confused. But it's about controlling the hunger, not controlling the calories. That's where why Ozempic is ultimately very successful because it's about controlling the hunger. That's why smoking causes weight loss because it controls the hunger and therefore you eat fewer calories. So you have both effects going on, right? Controlling hunger and lowering calories. People debate which one is the most important one. Ultimately, I think it's the root cause is the hunger and calories is sort of the proximate uh, cause. And you can't treat the proximate cause, right? It's like taking a fever and then taking a cooling blanket. That's fine, but you're not curing any infection, right? If an infection is causing a fever, you can't treat the fever. That's just symptomatic treatment. If you have sort of excessive hunger for whatever reason, um, which is causing you to eat too many calories, that's eating fewer calories is symptomatic treatment. That's why it doesn't work in the long term because you have this whole underlying issue that you haven't dealt with, which is the hunger. But if you just simply force people, and again, the studies have been done, and they are positive. Uh, that's why I bring it up. But it never works in real life. Because after six months, people just go back to the way they're eating, and everything just goes back to the, the same way. Same as The Biggest Loser, that, that show that was on for a long time. You can just set aside a period of time that you don't eat. At the time, people thought it was extremely bad for you. And I I looked through all the literature and I said, well, why is it bad for you? And they had all these reasons. There's all these myths about intermittent fasting and how it's going to cause you to gain weight and be tired and hungry and all these sorts of things. I said, well, no, there's actually a lot of data here over the last, you know, 2000 years that we've used intermittent fasting. And they're simply not true. And I can go over a few of those. But that's why there was nobody talking about it at the time. And that's where I started to sort of bring it into the uh, sort of public consciousness that this is a tool. That's you, all it is. Were you, you attacked for that at the time? Oh, absolutely. Like I got, I got attacked from all sides. I got, you know, doctors were coming after me. Dietitians were coming after me. Everybody thought I was going to do so much harm. And the funny part was that, you know, as I think back, as I spoke to a lot of colleagues, a lot of colleagues would say to me, you know what? I used to do that when I was in training. We did that all the time. We'd go 24 hours without eating because we're in the OR or we're in the ER or we are busy. So we did that constantly and nothing bad happened. And I remember thinking, you know what? As a doctor, I actually tell people to fast all the time. If you have to go for surgery, you need to fast. If you're after surgery, you need to fast. If you do fasting blood work, you need to fast. So why is it that I'm actually telling people to fast all the time 
And yet for weight loss, you shouldn't fast. That doesn't make any sense. And physiologically, from a body standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. When you don't eat, what happens in your body from a hormone standpoint is that your insulin's gonna fall, you're gonna allow your body to start using the calories that are in the body. 